Good morning, everyone. Um, greetings from Montreal. Uh, we're here for the start of the uh, assembly of the International Civil Aviation Organization, where IATA has presented or is presenting a number of papers for discussion. Um, today, we're joined by our Director General, Willie Walsh, uh, who will provide an overview of the current industry situation, uh, some of the agenda topics that we have with ICAO, uh, and then, as normal, we'll throw it open for questions and answers using the chat function. Um, so without further ado, Willie, over to you. Thank you, Tony, and uh, good morning from Montreal. Um, as Tony said, we're here on the occasion of the 41st General Assembly of ICAO. Uh, I think a lot of expectations for developments out of the Assembly, and certainly we'll be very interested to see how the global government community can come together to assist the industry in achieving our goals, particularly in relation to climate change. But maybe just uh, for context, uh, remind you of what the industry has gone through over the last few years and where we currently are. So if you can move to this slide, you can see dreadful uh, couple of years. Um, good news is we are making progress, but when you see the losses in 2020, 2021, and indeed this year where we're still expecting losses in the order of uh, 10 uh, billion US dollars. So uh, the industry will have lost around 190 billion US dollars in the three years since this pandemic has started. And it is interesting if you go back and uh, just look at the chart there between 2010 and 2019. I think that they, that was the first time the industry had made profits at an operating level uh, consecutively in, in 10 years, the best 10 years of the industry's uh, history and interesting if you look at that the average margin over that period was five and a half percent and you compare that to the uh, margins in uh, the last three years minus 29 percent minus uh, 1.8 percent in uh, expected in this year so um, very very tough time but uh, i think great credit to airlines to have been able to manage uh, through this crisis and it demonstrates the resilience of the industry. Uh, and just moving on now, if you look at uh, what we're seeing this year, it's expected that the US industry will be uh, profitable. Again, these are net margins. Uh, so margin as a percentage of uh, revenue. Uh, the rest of the global industry lagging behind the US, um, but you know, making good progress. I, I think Asia Pacific, uh, unfortunately, will continue to lag the rest of the industry given the ongoing border restrictions that uh, exist there. Uh, but uh, you know, I think this chart uh, highlights the um, the impact that border closures have had because the, the U.S. industry, as many of you will know, has a strong domestic uh, network which was largely. Um, largely untouched uh, by uh, government uh, regulations or, or closures through uh, the period. Uh, so it's mainly international travel that has significantly uh, suffered. And moving on to next chart, uh, you can see that in, uh, I think, uh, uh, in this display here, um, cargo has been resilient throughout. Uh, we've highlighted this uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, I think the importance of the industry being able to pivot its operations from primarily a, a passenger focused uh, industry to a cargo focused industry to ensure that critical supplies remained uh, available uh, throughout the period, uh, I, I think demonstrates how important this industry is to the global supply chain. Um, the demand for cargo has been quite strong and remains resilient throughout the period, slightly down in July, and I would expect that to be the same in August, about 3%. And you can see the difference between international in blue on the bottom there and domestic in red on the top. Uh, we've seen domestic recover strongly in uh, July. Uh, and again, I think the same will be true of August. And that's principally the recovery of the Chinese domestic market as the internal restrictions within China uh, were relaxed. So um, good progress being made on international travel. Uh, you can see there we're at about uh, 68% of where we were in uh, July of 2019. And if you consider that in 2021, international travel was at about 25% of where we were in 2019. It shows that international travel has been recovering strongly 
uh, through um, this period into uh, the, uh, the ordinary uh, summer period where you would expect traffic uh, demand to be strong. So um, th this chart really does reinforce our view that uh, border closures did nothing to prevent the spread of the virus, but had a massive impact on international travel. And as soon as those restrictions uh, at the border were removed, we saw a strong recovery. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the Asia Pacific region is lagging behind. Uh, we see international travel within Asia Pacific still only at about 25%, and that plays into uh, the pace at which uh, it will recover. So this shows our latest forecast in terms of uh, when do we get back to 2019 passenger uh, uh, figures. Uh, so you can see Africa we're expecting in 2025, Asia Pacific 2025, Europe in 24. So we should be ahead of 2019 in, in 2024. Uh, Latin America and Caribbean 24, Middle East 24, North America the strongest uh, 23 and, and globally 2024. Um, clearly, the, the biggest impact going into uh, next year will be what happens in China and whether China starts uh, to uh, relax the situation. Uh, and the situation in China, coupled with some of the economic headwinds that we're witnessing at the moment, has made our latest forecast slightly, very, very slightly uh, less optimistic than we had uh, previously looked at. But in the main, we are still looking at a global recovery in 2024 with good progress being made in 2022 and into 2023. And the next slide, uh, this shows just one of the headwinds that we're facing at the moment. Um, I think everybody will be familiar with the uh, rising oil price and the impact that energy prices will have on consumers and what you see here is in uh, red the uh, crude oil price in Brent and in blue the jet price and, and this is a very unusual development uh, starting uh, at the beginning of this year we saw what we call the, the crack spread the difference between the Brent or the crude price and the price of jet widened very significantly um, and although we have seen crude prices ease in recent months uh, we're still seeing elevated prices for uh, jet fuel. Now, now, some of that is understandable given that uh, the demand for jet fuel reduced significantly in 2020 and 2021. So refining capacity um, moved away from jet. Uh, but as that capacity came back online, we would have expected to see this crack spread uh, narrow significantly. It's still at rates that are uh, significantly elevated from historical rates, which you can see they're going back to uh, 2015 on, on this chart. But indeed, if I look at that period between 2010 and 2019, uh, the average spread was about 18%. Uh, so uh, Brent averaged $80 a barrel uh, through that 10 year period and, and jet was 18% more expensive. We, we've seen, as this chart, uh, chart demonstrates, we've seen that uh, spread uh, go over 60% uh, and indeed at the uh, end of September it was at 56%. Now it has it has eased a, a little bit but uh, still um, very very big difference between uh, crude prices and jet prices which uh, means that um, you know we will see uh, costs uh, continue to challenge the uh, industry uh, in 2022 and in 2023. And just maybe to, to comment briefly on what we expect from the uh, assembly. Uh, the main focus for us will be on uh, what ICAO calls their long term aspirational goal. Uh, I think as most people are aware, the, the industry uh, through IATA agreed to target net zero in 2050 at our AGM in, uh, in October of last year. Uh, I think a very significant and ambitious target for the industry, uh, but we have now aligned ourselves with the science and with the ambition of the Paris Agreement, and we will be looking to ICAO uh, to get the uh, global uh, governments and regulators equally uh, aligned and to agree on their long-term aspirational goal of uh, net zero in 2050. I think anything shy of that uh, and this assembly will be viewed as a failure. So while 
Um, you know, some of these targets are ambitious and the expectation is high. Uh, I think we have to be realistic that in the current environment, anything short of ICAO agreeing to uh, that long term as, uh, aspirational goal of net zero in 2050, I, I think will be a huge disappointment. It's not going to stop us uh, continuing on our road to net zero in 2050. Uh, but I think it would send a very important signal to governments and would help to uh, ensure that we get the right policy framework in place to assist the industry in its ambition. Uh, clearly, we see sustainable aviation fuels as being a key driver to uh, achieving our goals. Um, we need to see more production and widespread availability of sustainable aviation fuels. Um, I've said on many occasions that it's uh, absolute nonsense to, to believe that you need to incentivize the industry or force the industry to buy sustainable aviation fuels. We're, we're, we're buying every single drop of sustainable aviation fuel that we can get our hands on. What really needs to happen now is governments need to incentivize the production of sustainable aviation fuels. We, we need the traditional fuel suppliers to turn their attention uh, uh, to sustainable fuels. And, and, you know, it's great to see some new entrants in the market, companies like Neste, who are uh, producing sustainable fuels at volume and have ambitions to do so going forward. But we really do need see, to see a, a greater emphasis uh, on the production of sustainable fuels. We need governments to uh, come together and to incentivize and provide the right framework to ensure that we get greater production of sustainable fuels. And that will be absolutely key uh, given the uh, time available to achieve net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, sustainable fuels really do represent the best opportunity and a very exciting opportunity, not just for us in the airline industry, uh, but it should be seen as an exciting opportunity for governments and countries right across the world. So on that, I'll pause and hand back to uh, Tony, uh, and we can take uh, your questions. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Willie. Um, we have a few questions in the queue. Uh, I'll just remind everybody that uh, we will accept questions through the Q&A function, the chat function uh, on, on the uh, Teams website. Um, and we are here at ICAO, so we'll try and give priority to the ICAO related questions, but uh, I see there are also lots of non-ICAO related questions, so we'll try and get to as many of those as we can as well. Um, we'll start with uh, a first question uh, referencing uh, LTAG and the expectation of a 2050 net zero agreement being achieved at the assembly. Uh, the questioner asks on a scale of one to five, uh, with five being the most optimistic, uh, how optimistic are you uh, that the assembly will be able to achieve that agreement? That's a great question. I'm I'm probably at a four in terms of optimism. Um, but if the question was asked, how important is it on a scale of one to five? I'd say it's a five. Uh, as I said, it won't stop the industry moving to achieve our target, but it would really provide a, a strong signal um, from governments that they are aligned with the ambition of the industry, aligned with the, the science behind uh, the climate change. And more importantly, uh, I think it will provide the right signal that we need a, uh, a good framework and policy uh, decisions that will support that goal. So uh, I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, and as I said, uh, I recognize there are challenges to reaching a global agreement on that. But given the importance of the issue, particularly in the current environment, um, I think it would be a very, very positive signal from governments if they were to agree to the uh, ICAO long-term aspirational goal of net zero by 2050. Okay. Um, we have a, a kind of a follow-up question on that. Uh, the questioner says that IAT has been very clear with its target uh, for 2050 and uh, the path towards getting there, um, but he's wondering the ICAO term aspirational goal and whether that is sufficiently strong to, to be conclusive and satisfy the industry's requirements. I think that's a, a very good observation. Um, it disappointed me when I saw aspirational uh, there, uh, you know, a long-term aspirational goal rather than long-term goal. 
Um, I think it reflects the difference between the focus that a commercial business would have and what a, a government entity would have. Um, you know, we're, we're we're definitely more driven uh, and clearer in terms of our ambition here. But I, I think it is a, it is a very positive first step. Um, you know, I, I mentioned when uh, Corsia was agreed that I thought that was an excellent first step. I didn't think Corsia was going to be the, uh, you know, the, the, the be all and end all, but I thought it was a great first step to get a global agreement on a uh, framework, a single um, uh, policy issue to address offsetting, uh, to give credibility to offsetting uh, while it becomes important. Uh, Recognising, however, that the, the long term ambition that uh, both the industry has and uh, I think that government should have is to use in sector uh, reductions in carbon rather than uh, if you like out of sector. So um, I, I, I'll, I'll take it uh, if we get agreement on the long term aspiration, aspirational goal of net zero in 2050, I think that an excellent first step. Uh, and I think once that hurdle is cleared, then uh, I've no doubt that it will become a, a much hardened target by uh, governments right across the world. So um, I, I would see it as a, an important and positive first step for, for the industry. Okay. Uh, thank you. We have a couple of regional questions on the uh, concept of LTANK. Uh, one comes from Africa and uh, the questioner says with the reliance on fossil fuels and the cost of, of uh, an energy transition, is it realistic for African airlines or the African industry to be able to achieve net zero? I think, I think it is realistic for all of the industry and, and I think it's wrong to differentiate between regions in the way that maybe we would. When you, when you look at the financial performance, even in the richest parts of the world or in the, um, you know, the areas of the world where airlines have been uh, doing uh, well historically from profitability margins, they're still very, very small. You know, the idea that uh, this is an industry where some make uh, huge profits uh, and others huge losses. I, I think that's no longer the case. That probably would have typified the industry in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, but we have seen a significant performance in the global uh, industry's financial um, performance, a significant improvement in, in that uh, over the last, uh, certainly over the last 10, 15 years, taking the uh, the recent pandemic aside. I think the, the, the benefit of uh, this transition to uh, net zero and the path that we've identified through the use of sustainable aviation fuels is important because uh, countries should look at this as an opportunity uh, where they need no longer be dependent on importing uh, fossil fuel when in fact they will have the opportunity to develop their own uh, sustainable uh, fuel um, initially uh, through biofuels, but as the technology improves uh, through um, even more sustainable, what we call e-kerosene. So I think there's a real opportunity for countries here. Uh, you know, there are um, multiple pathways available today to produce sustainable aviation fuels. Um, this gives countries an opportunity to develop new industries um, uh, with you know, good quality jobs, uh, producing uh, a sustainable fuel and reducing their dependence on importing fuel. So, uh, you know, if, if I was looking at this um, from a, you know, what's the opportunity out there? I, I would see this as a big opportunity for African countries. Um, you know, it's going to be a challenge for everybody. We shouldn't underestimate the, the cost of transi transition is going to be difficult for all airlines. Um, but, uh, you know, it is an issue that uh, working together, ensuring that we can, uh, as an industry, demonstrate that, uh, you know, when these sustainable fuels are produced, we will buy them. And, uh, you know, that, that is the, the opportunity, as I said, that exists for uh, countries and airlines going forward. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a regional question coming to us from China. Um, and the questioner says that the China Air Transport Association has put out a statement saying that uh, carbon neutral growth uh, by 2050, uh, sorry, carbon neutral growth by 2020, uh, the Corsia mechanism and the long-term aspirational goal uh, will come with uh, competitive distortions uh, that will disadvantage developing countries. Um, and the questioner asks if uh, we agree with that and what our comments might be. 
Uh, no, I, I appreciate the, uh, the view being expressed by China and indeed uh, the Chinese members of IATA have been consistent in their approach to this. I think it's important to say that uh, the industry in China uh, has equal uh, ambition. You know, they are determined to achieve uh, net zero. Their time frame to, from doing, for doing so has been slightly different uh, to align with the Chinese government, which is net zero by 2060. I've always said that I would expect that ambition to uh, improve and to harden. And the one thing that uh, you can say about China is that when they set goals, they, they will achieve them. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, the industry um, is not a level playing field. Let, let's, let's be clear on that. You know, we don't have a level playing field today. Uh, will this provide uh, additional distortion that will make it difficult? I don't believe it will do so. Uh, it, it uh, you know, it, it does make it challenging for everybody. Um, even within regions, it's going to be more challenging for some, depending on the aspiration that the individual airline has in terms of its uh, growth. Uh, and I think these are, are being recognised and addressed through the debate that's going on in ICAO. And I think it will be interesting to see how that uh, develops over the next few a uh, few days and, and certainly into next week. Uh, but I think this is too important an issue. You know, we in the airline industry have recognized that for us to grow into the future, uh, not only do we need financial sustainability, which has been a challenge historically for the industry, uh, but we need environmental uh, sustainability and viability. So the two go hand in hand. Um, and I think it represents a, an opportunity for uh, airlines to uh, remodel their their business to ensure that they can achieve both of these ambitions, recognizing that today fuel is the single biggest element of a, an airline's cost base. So anything that we can do to improve our efficiency through uh, the uh, better performance of aircraft, um, the better performance uh, for air traffic control, all of these issues uh, become very important. And I think that's why this aspirational goal um, becomes important as well, because I, I think this will remove the uh, protection that some of the uh, suppliers in our chain have had. Um, you know, the, the inbuilt inefficiency in air traffic control systems globally is a disgrace. Um, and, you know, we, we see politicians encouraging and sometimes criticizing the industry for, for not being more ambitious, while at the same time, these same politicians have done nothing to uh, address the uh, structural inefficiency in air traffic control systems. Uh, and we see, for example, even in the case of France only last week, uh, air traffic control strikes disrupting the flow of traffic, forcing airlines to uh, bypass French airspace, uh, thereby increasing uh, the fuel that they burn and increasing the generation of CO2. Disgraceful behaviour. And, uh, you know, th this should not be tolerated. Um, you know, we should have a situation uh, because from a technical point of view, we do have the ability to uh, overfly um, areas that are being disrupted by strikes where the provision of service can be given by uh, other service providers. So, uh, you know, the, the, the situation, I, I think, is, is too important to ignore. Uh, and while there may be some um, distortion to the, the market, I don't believe it's something that uh, will necessarily create a, a significant hurdle for airlines. Okay, thank you, Willie. Um, we have another follow-up question uh, while we're on the topic of China. And the questioner asks, can there be an agreement if China is a holdout? I believe there, there can. Um, you know, the, the, the important issue here is we're focusing on international aviation. Uh, the Chinese market is very important, but it's principally a large domestic market. And in fact, we've, we've seen that in the, the figures that uh, we've been showing over the, the, the last couple of years, where China, in effect, is closed to international travel because of the, the border restrictions, although there are some flights. Uh, it's, it's very, very uh, few compared to where we were in 2019. But even at a, a global level, international uh, flying to and from China is still um, relatively small, whereas the domestic market is huge. Uh, so China can deal with their domestic market as, as they uh, see um, best uh, and, and will certainly do that. So if you look at the, the contribution that China makes to uh, global CO2, most of that comes from their domestic 
uh, market, which is significantly larger than the CO2 that they produce from their uh, international flying. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's an important uh, thing to recognize. So when, when we look at, uh, say, for example, 2019, where the global industry produced about 914 million tonnes of CO2, uh, about uh, a third of, of that uh, came from domestic flying, which is not covered by uh, either Corsia, because that Corsia deals with international aviation, uh, or this uh, long-term aspirational goal, of, you know, is principally an international uh, issue as well as domestic. But Corsia deals with uh, international travel rather than domestic travel. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll stick with another couple of questions on environment and then we'll move to some other topics. Um, we have a questioner who's, who notes that EasyJet is dropping offsets uh, and you're stressing of the role of SAF in achieving net zero. And the question is, uh, with, the, with those developments happening or those statements being made, do you think that Corsia is becoming obsolete and will this be in any way reflected at ICAO's discussions? No, Corsia is not becoming obsolete. Uh, and I think you've got to differentiate between what uh, EasyJet was doing and uh, I think they deserve credit for their initiative. Um, but you know what airlines will do under Corsia is very different. The, uh, the criteria around Corsia qualifying um, offsetting is, is very, very strict uh, and the procedures uh, around monitoring and verification equally strict. So what we have is a global scheme, uh, highly regulated, um, top quality, uh, audited, so you know you can prove that where the money is going and money is being spent is generating uh, the the right result. Uh, and I think um, you know while some offsetting schemes in the early uh, stages of uh, the concept of offsetting were questionable, uh, and I, I wouldn't hesitate to say that in some cases uh, very questionable. Uh, I don't think that applies to Corsia because what you have here is is a quality system uh, where the criteria to qualify for offsetting under Corsia uh, is of a very high standard and uh, everything will be uh, properly recorded, properly measured, properly verified, audited. And uh, I think that's uh, very important, particularly when it's being done on a, uh, a global basis. So I, I see the two issues being very, very separate uh, and uh, I remain um, optimistic about uh, Corsia, as I said, when it was agreed, I thought it was a, a very positive first step. I, I didn't think it would be the end goal, um, but I thought it was very positive because you got a global agreement and extremely difficult to get governments right across the world uh, to agree to uh, anything, to be honest with you. We saw that, um, you know, just recently with this uh, pandemic, you know, we, we, we saw nearly every country going their own way, um, even in areas like the EU, where you would have expected greater coordination, there was a total lack of coordination in the early stages. So to get uh, countries right across the world coordinated and agreed on a uh, an offsetting, uh, offsetting scheme for aviation, I think was a great achievement and provides the first step in the way to the industry's uh, goal of uh, net zero by 2050. Okay, thank you. And then we'll take one last question on climate change and then we'll move to some other topics. Um, this question asks whether uh, the assembly could agree to a SAFT mandate um, and whether that would, if that were the case, would that be on airlines or would that be on manufacturers? Well, I, I'm very clear on this. Uh, you know, I think what we need to do is to create a, an environment where more SAFT is produced. Uh, so therefore, you know, the, um, the policy framework we want is where the production of sustainable aviation fuels is incentivized. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity to create a new industry that not only generates good jobs, but is very positive for the environment. And I think there's very good reason why we should expect governments to support that industry and to put the right policy frameworks in place uh, to incentivize the production of SAF. Mandating airlines to buy something that isn't available makes no sense. Uh, absolutely no sense whatsoever. Uh, you know, airlines have demonstrated that they will buy SAF because even with the very significant price differential between 
sustainable fuels and traditional kerosene, airlines bought every single drop of sustainable fuel that was produced in 2021. Every single drop, and would have bought more if it was available, and will do the same in 2022. So you don't need to mandate the airlines to buy it. <laughs> airlines will buy the product if it's made available. And that's even where it's available at prices that are two to three times, in fact, two and a half to three times uh, the price of kerosene. So despite the financial uh, challenge um, facing airlines, they have continued to demonstrate their commitment. So get more production, airlines will buy it. I, and I can guarantee you, uh, you will not see a situation where SAF is produced and not uh, acquired by the industry, because uh, I know from talking to airline CEOs that they're looking for, for more sustainable fuels. So mandating the, the industry to buy a product that currently isn't available makes no sense. What we need, and that's why this uh, ICAO assembly is so important, what we need is the right policy framework in place so that governments incentivize the production of this so that we can demonstrate we're all we're all working together to achieve an environmental goal that is absolutely critical.